so yes, this is uh, a panel about uh, what all what makes this all possible, all kind of the hybrid work and, 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 and all that. It's about uh, digital transformation. And so we'll talk about uh, uh, where it started and where it is going. But before we do, I would uh, ask a very basic question. So what is digital transformation? Or perhaps I forgot, of course, the most important thing. Could you please introduce yourself oh, sure. quickly? Uh, so Farah Ali, I'm a VP Technology Growth Strategy at Electronic Arts. So I look at tech m &A, future tech strategy, um, acquisitions. Don Rillier, uh, Chief Innovation Officer, U.S. Bank. Mick Slattery, CEO of Compu Company. Can you hear us now? Diego, uh, Neil. It's Neil Abdi. Okay. Can, can, can you quickly introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah, this is Neil Abdi, Chief Digital Officer at BlackRock. And Diogo. Hi, this is Diogo Rao, and I am Chief Information and Digital Officer at Eli Lilly. Okay, cool. So let, let me start again. Uh, first question, what is digital transformation? And I'll, I'll give kind of some precedence to, to you guys online. So Diogo, uh, uh, this <laughs> digital transformation is, is, is a, I would say, overused term uh, at The Economist. We're not allowed uh, to use it anymore. So, but is that taking it too far? Yeah. Well, I, I have to, you know, it's funny you should say that because I have a little bit of a confession to make. Uh, and I hope you don't bust me with my boss on this, but my title, as you just heard, is Chief Information and Digital Officer. And I'm not entirely sure what digital actually means. Uh, digital could mean so many different things that I struggle a little bit with, uh, I actually struggle a little bit with the term. And then you get, you talk about digital transformation. And for me, that just takes things to an entirely different level. Because if you think about what a transformation is, a transformation has a defined beginning and a defined end. You think of uh, water transforming into ice. And you know when the uh, water is done because it, you've got ice. Uh, or for the nerds among us, if you like the Transformers, you know when Optimus Prime is done transforming because he looks like a semi. But when you talk about a digital transformation, uh, I don't know what that really looks like because in our world, I can't tell you when we're done with it. All of our digital projects, all of our transformations, uh, I, could, I could not for the life of you tell you what the actual end is. We have lots underway, but the end is hard to pin down. Sarah, I mean, you've worked for companies that are kind of purely digital, so made of water in mm -hmm. the, in the mm -hmm. sense, kind of what, what does digital transformation mean for you? Yeah, I mean, I think on its own, it is, it's more of a buzzword. So it's really in context of what's the problem you're trying to solve. And if you look at it that way, it's a capability you can add to your organization to help you you know, do the transformation that you want. So do you want to retain talent? Do you want to add a certain capability? Um, and if you want to do that, you know, what type of transformation can you actually uh, put towards that? So um, for example, um, you know, AI, there's a lot of conversation about AI and data. Um, you may want to track employee engagement. You may want to know if employees are burning out and you may want to do survey uh, you know, process around that to see over time, can you continuously learn about employee engagement and improve that? So it, it just depends what your goals are, but you know, it really has to be done with this larger business value that you want to create. In and of itself, it, it really doesn't mean anything. Mm. Anil, what, what does digital transformation mean at BlackRock? Well, it, it, I think it starts from the basic understanding that the, the transformation part is the is is what the organization has to go through there is some involvement in technology in there but i think the main focus for us is to really rethink some of the user experiences and to use technology as a way to scale some of these experiences through data and through content and to the extent i think as some of the other panelists have mentioned i think there is no endpoint because it's a it's always a it's an always an evolving journey there's you never get to a state where you say like i've arrived at the perfect user experience um as user needs evolve as the business needs evolves it is a continuous refinement that you keep on doing and you bring in new technologies and new capabilities yeah. to enable you to scale those experiences so that's what it means here at blackrock and i think uh, we can get into more details as we as we go through the uh, through this exercise Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. So let's, let's talk a bit about the technologies that enable digital uh, transformation. Um, and st let's start with the cloud and the cloud kind of as the kind of the or kind of the main infrastructure. Uh, uh, so Don, so everything is going to go to the cloud. Uh, uh, so that that's where the company will live in the end. Um, you know, it's really about scalability there uh, for us. You know, as part of our digital transformation, we're really looking 
at um, effectively a digital and human strategy. So how can we uh, get our employees uh, the right tools they need to serve our customers? Um, our customers don't want to not ever talk to a banker again. Uh, they do want to be able to do everything digitally though, either on their phones or online. So setting up our systems to be able to scale to support that is really important. Uh, also, being able to empower our employees through AI uh, and cloud services, I think is really, really key as well. So we're looking at our contact centers, um, uh, enabling uh, cloud services and artificial intelligence to give them uh, real time information uh, on the calls that they're taking. Hmm. But, when, but again, on the cloud, does that mean that US Bank in 10 years will entirely live on the cloud? Is that, is that where, where companies will live? Kind of, okay, they have employees, but actually they live somewhere else in, in, in the computing skies. Most of the systems will be on the cloud. Some things uh, may still be on-prem based on uh, regulations and, mm -hmm. and, and other things that need to be kept uh, extra secure. But most of it's going to be in the cloud. We see um, you know, the future of financial services as being very API-driven. So effectively, financial services will be part of other experiences. Um, we're already seeing this quite a bit with uh, our developer a API platforms. Uh, we're able to easily enable fintechs to become part of our value proposition. Um, at the same time, we see fintechs uh, outsourcing things that they can't do because they're not regulated entities to banks. So uh, the key for us is being able to be as flexible and scalable and as interoperable uh, as we possibly can. Thanks. And, and, and the cloud's make, huge, a big part of it. Yeah. Mick, th th thoughts on the cloud for you guys? Yeah, the, the cloud is an enabler, it's flexibility. And if you want a really flexible system, it'll probably be on the cloud in the future. There'll be some stuff that doesn't need to be as dynamic because it's well understood and very, um, you know, sort of purpose driven and maybe that'll be on-prem. But I think if you want to adapt to the future, it'll probably be on the cloud because I think that gives you the most flexibility and ability to uh, create, Neil used the word that resonates with me, experiences. Like the thing that has shifted is technology is interesting and it'll continue to evolve. It's all about the experience you're creating. We've focused a lot in the past on the consumer experience, the customer experience, and I think the thing that I'm seeing now is how do you take, whether it be AI, which isn't intended to, it's intended to augment and enhance humans, how do you take the cloud, which is really flexible, you can even use um, IoT, which to me is the telemetry of the experience. How do you bring those all together to create experiences not only for your employees, but your constituents? Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess my answer is more it depends. So there may be some very complex workloads that can't all be moved to the cloud, but there are patterns which, you know, you can automate and easily move to the cloud. And I think a lot of companies are doing that for scalability, for availability. You can also then just not worry about maintenance or security because those are, you know, well-managed services. But there are cases where, you know, you may have a hybrid uh, ecosystem or you may have an on-prem ecosystem because that just is cheaper. Um, you need a custom build, like maybe the low latency, high availability rate of transaction cannot be served by the public cloud. So I think, again, it, it depends on the problem. Um, but like, for example, at EA, um, we had this um, uh, occasion where we shipped this AAA game and everything was kind of a custom on-prem build. And we realized that part of it, the game server part of it, was something that you know, we could look at player patterns and we could match it to you know, right-sizing the game servers. And so we said, okay, that part could live on the cloud where you can then get better telemetry and you could understand, okay, I can scale up and scale down and it's e efficient. And that was a great cost benefit, but the real benefit for us was we could spend that time thinking about the player experience that we can enable. So if not a lot of people of my skill level are playing online, how do I then build bot capabilities or NPCs to actually match them so that they have a near human-like experience. Mm -hmm. So it's really what does it unlock in terms of value where you can spend your time doing higher order things because you can now move just, you know, just repetitive workloads to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's lots, lots of talk about multi-cloud. I mean, of course, that's to some extent a buzzword, but, but uh, of course, there, there is a danger mm -hmm. of, of being locked into to, to one vendor. Absolutely. So how, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, do, do you have your own kind of keep your own kind of computing 
capacities or I mean, we, you know, we're multi-cloud because, yeah, we want the optionality of the best rates, but we also want the optionality of, you know, somebody, if, um, you know, GCP came up with something new that maybe AWS didn't have, you know, can we actually go and utilize that? And if we didn't, if we were just all locked into AWS, then we didn't have that optionality. So you get the ability to use all the innovation out there. Um, you know, some companies, smaller in size, you know, it may make sense for them to just double down and... Um, because again, they don't have complex use cases, so they might do it just for the cost reason, but definitely for a company our scale, optionality is more important. Uh, Diogo, conf what, what's Eli Lilly's approach to multi-cloud and, and, and lock-in? I mean, yeah. So Eli Lilly is taking an approach of multi-cloud as well, so that we're not locked into one vendor. Uh, that said, uh, in my prior life, uh, before I joined uh, Eli Lilly a year and a half ago, I was at Apple, and at Apple, for some of our uh, own services like our uh, Apple online store uh, and our Apple store app, uh, things like that. We also needed to work on the cloud um, and we actually tried a few different experiments and we, we, did, uh, we did some where we fully invested in one vendor and uh, we did others where we made it multi-cloud. And I came away with a really uh, important learning from that, which is uh, you, you, either strategy can work, uh, but what's really important is that you just need, you need to make the decision upfront. You don't wanna get locked in to one platform without the benefits that come with that. And there are a lot of benefits from being wed to one platform. Uh, you, can tie, you can take advantage of a bunch of services that are, you know, that are available that you don't have to write from scratch, but you're locked in. Uh, um, and the, on the flip side, you can design everything so that it can uh, go across uh, multiple clouds, uh, but uh, it's going to cost you. You're not going to be able to take advantage of any of those uh, any of those special features. And either approach can work. You just you, you just want to make that choice up front so that you don't uh, lock yourself in without getting the benefits uh, that come with it. Hmm. Okay, let's, let's let's talk a bit more about AI and IoT. Kind of, you mentioned that was kind of, uh, uh, and they, they they discussed about separately, kind of. Uh, two other buzzwords, but I, I think they're kind of the two sides of thing, the same coin, it seems to me, at least that's what you told me. In, in yeah, and, and may, it just might be my perspectives, but in the world of IoT, it, everything from sensors to video, it gives you rich telemetry about what's happening in the environment at any given time or over a period of time. And that is massively valuable for all kinds of experiences you're trying to create or prevent. And so that really understanding, you, you could use a lot of technology, you can deploy it, but if you don't understand the experience or the outcome you're trying to create, you're gonna be spending a lot on sensors and other things that may or may not yield anything for you. And then AI, and, and again, this is just the way I think about it. You know, I don't think we're talking Terminator and people who are gonna be replaced by uh, you know, the metal robots. It's about how do you empower humans, in a world of humans plus technology, I think you even said it, Don, yeah. in a human plus technology world, AI has to be an augmentation. And so then you say, right, what am I augmenting? I'm augmenting people, brain power, and why am I doing that? So they can either create a better outcome for their customers or they can be more productive. So to me, just echoing back on, it's not about the technology, it's about the, the experience or the outcome you're trying to create and how do you put these pieces together? Now, Neil, um, I get, take it IoT doesn't play a big role at, at uh, BlackRock, but correct me if I'm wrong, but AI will or is. Uh, so, so AI, AI is AI is clearly playing a playing a big role across uh, financial services, and specifically in BlackRock, we we think about AI, um, especially in the context of of digital transformation, as enabling us to bridge. Uh, typically, in, in 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 the past era of technology, there's always a a trade-off between being high-tech and being personalized and high-touch. And, and I think with AI, we are now being able to create new experiences that were not possible to do before. So as an example, uh, we are bringing AI uh, chatbot-based experiences into our online support. So now AI is helping us support agents really deflect 80, 90% of the questions where they traditionally would require a a person to pick up the phone or find somebody to, to talk to. And now you can 24 by seven uh, by 365 be able to find answers to your questions. And, and the AI is, is really helping improve the customer experience. At the same time, it's actually taking off the more mundane kind of activities so that 
the human part of the expertise can really be applied to a lot more complex set of questions, a lot more questions that are not that are not straightforward to answer. And so in many ways, it's helping us really segment the problem space into things that are repeatable, but relatively easy that AI can do and to, to the point uh, on augment, augmenting uh, human capabilities and things that are more complex that requires deeper understanding that we really want our experts to be focused on. And, and we have been using that now uh, for a while and showing tremendous results. Um, and also we find that customers are ready for it. It's no longer that the customers, you know, think that it's it's odd to talk to a chatbot. I think the new generation uh, of, of, of users and customers are very trained in being able to do that. And so we're entering a really, really interesting era in which AI and, and human capabilities um, work together uh, to, to solve some really complex problems. Thanks, Neil. Now, now Don, how at, at US Bank do you kind of identify weaknesses in your digital strategy or what you need to do kind of how, uh, uh, what, what's, what's the process of, of, of deciding where you, where you invest, invest next in, in, in your digital transformation? Yeah, there's really two big areas. Uh, you've got to look, look for the gaps that you have um, and, and, and understand whether you can apply technology to solve that in a reusable way. A lot of what we do is about um, where there's one-off solutions. Um, do we really need five different solutions across the bank that does a similar thing? Um, and the answer to that is no. Uh, we can build a platform that's reusable uh, across the entire bank for all of our business lines. Um, it speeds time to market. Uh, it may actually uh, makes for a more consistent customer experience in many cases across, uh, across our business lines. Uh, so our, you know, our retail customers have the same experience that our wealth customers do uh, because we have a design platform that's sitting on top of uh, a design system that's sitting on top of back-end platforms uh, that are consistent across uh, the group. So that's really the way we, we approach it, is we look for those gaps. We look for where we have one-offs, and we look for technology solutions that can meet those needs in the form of platforms uh, that we can reuse across our lines of business. Now, Diogo, uh, does that sound right for you? I mean, or, or do you approach these things differently at Eli Lilly? Or I mean, bank is well, different I, than, than what you do. It, it is differently, uh, or it is a little bit different, perhaps. But uh, we all have our gaps, and as you've said, there's uh, there's no shortage of them. Uh, and so we can always find new gaps to go after. Uh, my my uh, what what I've noticed uh, for um, Lily, and I believe this is typical of a, of a pharma industry, is uh, the first thing you do when you identify a gap is you go out, get a team together, and you put together a 100-page PowerPoint document <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that identifies uh, what the gap is, where, where it came from. You put together um, a three-year plan to fill the gap. Uh, and of course, you know, we're in the pharma industry, we work on these really long timetables. So we, we, we pad our, our, our times to, to make sure that we, we give ourselves plenty of space. But that's not what we should do. Uh, what I believe is that we should see a gap, and then we should try to plug it. We should uh, let's not get the perfect fix, but let's get a let's get a gap, or let's uh, put in a, um, a stop gap and uh, just plug it. And we should try it, and we should learn it, and, and learn from it, and go uh, and uh, then adapt it. And I think that's the biggest uh, the the biggest frustration I have with digital transformations in general is that the focus is on the strategy for it and not enough on that the actual implementation of it. And if there's one thing, if I could change with my magic wand on all of that, it would just be to get everybody, and not just, not just us, but every, uh, every industry, every company out there to just try things out. When you see a gap, don't, don't get a team together and put together a slides, put together a fix and just experiment. Mick, do you agree? I like Diego's approach for sure. <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it's interesting um, those gaps are opportunities. Uh, the first place I would go is I'd talk to your stakeholders, whether it be customers, whether it be employees, um, people on the manufacturing floor. Like they know best what's going on, and some of them have ideas. We have we have technicians out in the field that have won awards from our customers because they see things. Like you know, one guy redesigned how a particular person can use as simple as a checkout area because they were handicapped. Didn't ask, just did it, and all of a sudden wow, awards are coming in, hey, we need to rethink this, and thank you for enabling you know, some of our handicapped associates. So if you just turn the power of human 
uh, thought and invention and try it out, be careful what you can unleash. You might really like it. Sarah, we've, we've talked a lot about digital transformation from the customer perspective or from a technology perspective, but there's, of course, employees. And from what you sent me in your talking points, you feel strongly about kind of how to include those employees. Can, can, can you tell, uh, tell us more? Yeah, um, this morning we were at a round table and you know, one of the concluding thoughts was that you know, the future prediction for employee experience is that it will be, the bar will be consumer experience. You know? So what we expect as consumers, that's what employees are going to be looking for. And, and I think that's very true. And so I think kind of building on that, um, you know, just applying transformation or sort of saying this is a gap and we should go you know, address it, you know, to mix point, who are the stakeholders? In this case, they're the employees. And how do you go you know, do a learning exercise to really understand what are their gaps and then how do you prioritize? Because not all gaps are equal, right? And so where is that 80% ROI where you can get the most uh, for most of the employees? And then you sort of say, okay, now do I apply a technology solution? Do I apply a culture solution? Do I apply a leadership solution? And there's maybe some ways where you need to do all, all of those. I think the second piece is, um, you know, in, in all of this, you're also building behaviors. So how do you, you know, what's the psychology behind that? How do you create something that lasts? Um, and so to build these sticky behaviors is a whole other set of problems that now, now you've gone on this kind of transformation journey, you've got this feedback, you've addressed it, how do you make sure you don't swing the pendulum back and then you have to go to another project that starts and ends but doesn't really stick? And so how do you build the behaviors? And I think that's where an interesting thing could be to build in, you know, get psychologists and neuroscientists and sort of other behavior specialists to come in when, it, when it's about employee experience to really think about, you know, how do we uh, impact behaviors, not mm. just uh, outcomes. Yeah. Neil, um, employees are sometimes a, a barrier or can be a barrier to digitization or digital transformation. And I wonder kind of what, what are your strategies to kind of avoid that? I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I just la missed the first part of your question, strategies yeah, to avoid. Sorry about that. So employees can be a, a barrier to digital tr transformation. And, and, yeah. and I wonder, BlackRock, how, how, how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? Yeah, I, no, I think this is the, the people part of digital transformation, which is probably the most critical piece of it. Um, I think first and foremost, um, what digital and tra technologies and transformation is, is doing is that it's making a lot of skills obsolete much faster than, than it used to be. Um, and so there's this constant need for people to stay up to date with, with what's happening, new technologies, new capabilities. And I find that the traditional traditional learning model that society has, in which somebody goes to a four-year college, comes out of that, is called an expert, is anointed an expert. Five years later, their skill sets are no longer valid for what, where, the, where the world is headed. I think there is a, a huge opportunity for companies and businesses to to start taking on a little bit of the, the, the learning agenda on behalf of their employees and helping employees keep up with, uh, with, with, with the changes that are happening. But also as individuals, I think we have to look at our own, our own skill sets with AI and cloud. Every five years, the, the technologies we use uh, is different. It's getting more complex. Uh, and it's changing the, 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 the contract between businesses and, and, and employees and society. And I think that's something we care about a lot, and, and especially for those of us in the digital area, that's something of both a concern, but also an opportunity uh, to really figure out better models and, uh, by which you know, skill building and, and uh, you know, skill development can become a priority in, in every organization. And definitely that's something we are doing a lot in BlackRock, especially on certain, certain key capabilities that we feel are going to be essential for employees in the future. But let's talk about what, what, what is next. Uh, I mean, two new buzzwords. Uh, one we'll talk about a lot tomorrow, metaverse. And uh, then, of course, there's the other one. And The Economist, I think, doesn't have a conference on that yet, <laughs> which is Web3. Uh, uh, Diogo, what, what do you think will these kind of technologies, so to speak, play in the digital transformation? All right. I, I, I'm going to take the somewhat cynical approach on these. Uh, because, uh, you know, you, you notice that we all here are meeting, uh, well, in person or in, uh, in a classical format. None of us are wearing VR headsets. Uh, and I feel like, you know, the, the metaverse has been coming and we'll, we'll all be wearing VR headsets that are coming soon. Web3 is coming, uh, is, is just right around the corner. 
But you know, we've heard the story before. IPv6 is just right around the corner, or quantum computing is just about uh, is just about to happen. Quantum computing, we said was going to happen within five years, twenty years ago, and we still say it's it's five years today. So I, uh, the cynic in me says uh, that it's still going to be a while before we see these uh, these um, all all of these things happen. But of course, when that does happen, you don't want to be behind the cur be behind the curve. I do think that the metaverse does provide a, a great opportunity to. Uh, for in, in some applications, like uh, there are really good training applications, for example. Uh, I also think that there's, uh, I also think it could work wonders uh, in recruiting uh, and helping to filter out perhaps uh, some bias that happens, unconscious bias that can happen early in, in the process. So I do, I do like it. I'm just, I, I'm a little bit of a skeptic on a, on a few of these. Okay. Neil, um, when we w will we see kind of the BlackRock metaverse and... Uh, uh, let's say BlackRock running on a blockchain. Um, I think the I think the blockchain part probably uh, uh, maybe you know closer than the metaverse uh, part. I, I agree with Diego. I think uh, I think the metaverse is is again one of those opportunities that exists. But I think the killer application is still to be still to be figured out uh, on on what that would be, especially uh, especially in, in in the industry we are in, and so. Again, we are keeping a close eye on many of these evolving technologies. We're doing limited experimentation in a couple of areas, but uh, yet we are very far from being all in on, on, on any of these uh, capabilities at this point. And Farah, do you, I mean, working for EA, you're probably not a skeptic of the metaverse, or you've, you've already created it to some extent at least. That's true. I mean, gaming is a, a sort of a metaverse. It's an immersive, real-time, online in context experience. Um, I think as technologies, you know, we talk about Web3 or, or Metaverse, it sometimes feels like they're like solutions looking for a problem. Uh, because as a technologist, I think about, you know, um, could I do this with a shared database? Okay, then why would I use blockchain, right? I, I love the technology of blockchain, but I think it has yet to be, you have to convince me at least of like, here's a clear use case that can only be solved by Web3 or, or the Metaverse. Um, and, you know, I mean, kind of what Diego was saying, and you know, I'm still waiting for Jetsons, flying cars, <laughs> future, it's not here. So I think it's just that it takes time. Um, you know, these technologies have been around. I mean, blockchain's been around for 10 plus years now. Um, and, and perhaps we need the killer use case. But I do believe that um, it's suited to certain use cases. So yes, gaming is a real-time immersive experience. You already can say that that is a metaverse. But the definition of what the metaverse is, which is, completely interoperable digital twin experience of the, the real world. Um, and part of me, I don't know if I want that. So I think there's a whole uh, human side of it. And, and, and is that really going to make us more connected or not? So I, I just, I'm, I'm waiting to find the real problems um, and then using these as solutions to those problems. Yeah, since, since we're talking about buzzwords, there, there are two others kind of, uh, I think will be talked about quite a lot in the future. One. Of course, digital twins and, and the others, foundation models. Don, kind of, any any thoughts on those? Kind of, um, digital twins, you know, they've actually been around for a yeah. long time in engineering. So, uh, but you know, you can see uh, how these things are going to be able to, uh, you know, drive automation in, in physical physical plants like buildings, right? And when you tie uh, digital twin type technology in with automation, Internet of Things, uh, arrays of sensors. You can be, you'll be able to see environmentally aware retail spaces mm -hmm. uh, that might be able to communicate with uh, powerful personal AI that you may have with you on your, your devices. Uh, and that may enable spaces that can transform to, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, it, it'll enable spaces that may be able to transform uh, around you as you, as you, as you navigate them. Um, you know, in financial services, uh, I, I think financial twi uh, digital twins may be able to provide customers with a powerful modeling capability in the future. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, th these are all the types of things that we're definitely experimenting with. Yeah. And foundation models, is that on your radar? GPT-3, Dell-E? Uh, not yet. No. I, I find them super exciting. Um, I love, I don't know if people have looked at Dolly or Stable Diffusion and then just the kind of things that you can do with, you know, text to image and what it means for, like, generative AI, what that means for creatives. And, yeah, so I think foundational models are actually one of the best sort of use cases I've seen for big data and AI that's actually 
Um, that's actually, I think, pretty transformational in the last In, last in gaming, months. do you think that, that these models will actually create the world or the games? You, you now have to painstakingly program. Yeah, they might, but you know, I, I even think about it as, you know, as, as mixed set with augmenting, right? So um, I can think about um, creatives. Uh, you know, I have this weird thought and it would take me days to actually try and picture it. I can actually type it in and say, you know, uh, show me a teddy bear on the moon in the form of Picasso and you can, you, you actually get a pretty good likeness of it. And so the, it lets me uh, get to concept really quickly and maybe the in-game thing will be a hand-drawn model, but I think the the creativity it opens up for language, for art, um, and with augmentation is, is huge. So I don't know, Mick, if you if you agree or I was going to go in a slightly different place, <laughs> which is with all these, the thing we can't lose sight of, and somebody mentioned it. I think it might have been Neil about uh, AI on support and whatnot. We, we still have customers who they want to talk on the phone. Uh, my kids won't solve any problem that requires talking on the phone if they can't do it on a phone. And so I think for all these things, bringing in the human element of generations, preferences, and what that experience looks like is massively important. Because there's enormous potential if it's applied in the right way. And by the way, I'm going to be a flying polar bear based on the earlier metaverse conversation. Panda versus polar bear, I'm a little partial to the polar bear. OK, we, we're running out of time. Uh, one, one last quick question. I mean, it, you guys said, I think it was Neil, uh, uh, that, uh, and Yoga, you're never done with digital transformation. But still, we're moving towards some endpoint, even if we never reach it. And I'm, I'm, I want to ask you, once the digital transformation is done, there's nothing more to transform, or almost nothing more to transform. What type of enter or company are we going to end up with? Uh, what, what's kind of your vision of the completely digitally transformed enterprise, Diogo? I really do struggle with that question because I, I can't quite see an end in sight. I mean, even if you think of companies that are born digitally, uh, I, I still can't see an end to it. I mean, if, if you take Uber uh, and Lyft, that uh, sure, born, you know, we, there was never, they never had to automate paper. Uh, they never they didn't come out of taxi services, so they were already uh, digital from the beginning. But even them, you can say, you could say, well, the next stage in their digital transformation could be self-driving cars. The next, or there's going to be one more thing beyond that. Or when we get through that, then we're going to work on teleportation next. Or I don't, you know, I don't know what what, what it's going to be. But I just, uh, I, it doesn't feel like there there ever is an end. And maybe maybe that's part of the that's part of why we've all chosen uh, to be in this profession is just because uh, technology doesn't stop. Neil. Yeah, I think um, I think digital transformation is going to be becoming more and more transformation, and the digital part will be implicit because I think all transformation has as an element of technology, and will continue to have a big element of technology built into it. So I think ten years from now we will be looking at this as pure business transformation. The word digital will probably just go away, and and that will be totally fine for the rest of us. Nick, uh, the end state is a team that always asks what's next. Um, they're just used to bring on the next challenge and we'll go tackle it. Um, and because technology will evolve, the challenge, there'll always be something next. So um, it's a, to me, it's about a team that learns, can work together dynamically, and always ask what's next. Don. Yeah, I would, I, that, uh, I like the phased approach to that. Um, and, you know, we, we also went through a, or an agile transformation at the same, and I stood, I was around for some of the, the panels uh, earlier on that. Uh, but it's about, you know, once you're done with that initial phase of what's the next thing? Um, uh, how do we evolve next, right? So, and, and having those teams ready to pivot and go. Sure. I think my transformation by definition is continuous, ever evolving. So I think it's, um, it's perhaps more important to have metrics. You can't improve what you don't measure. And then just sort of be in that cycle of continuous learning and improving. Um, I think that's what it is. Great. Thank you very much. Yep, uh, thank you. Next time we'll talk about transformation.